Welcome back. You are listening to the It's Never Too Late to Be Healthy podcast, and I'm your host, Kevin Brady. Through my own experiences as a lifelong athlete, community volunteer, author, and company founder, I'm on a mission to educate, inspire, and motivate individuals of all ages to improve all aspects of their health and live their best life to the fullest. I built my company, Advoca Health, based on this mission. Advoca Health assists companies and individuals navigate the very best health solutions both at home and in the world. On this podcast, I meet with industry leading experts and partners with the aim to share simple strategies and tips to help you live a healthier, longer, and happier life. Sit back and enjoy the show. And whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure today to welcome a good friend and one of my superheroes in the plant-based and whole food plant-based world, and that is Dr. Michael Clapper. Uh, I met Dr. Clapper actually on a, a cruise in February 2020 called Holistic Holidays at Sea, which was basically a, a plant-based cruise with 1,500 uh, people on it that endorse a plant-based diet. Um, he was one of the keynote speakers, and I uh, chatted with him uh, after, and uh, was very fortunate that he endorsed my book as well and great, gave a great testimonial. Um, today, we get into and dive deep into a number of different topics. First, his, uh, uh, sh he shares his personal story. Uh, he's been plant-based over 41 years, and uh, he shares what prompted him to, to go that way. Uh, we dive deep in just the benefits of a plant-based diet, uh, first and foremost, from a health standpoint, what he's seeing in his patients. Secondly, from an animal and agricultural standpoint. And third, uh, the benefits of a plant-based uh, diet in terms of uh, climate and uh, climate change uh, and impact on the world. Uh, Dr. Clapper is 74, 74 years old. I say he's a super young 74-year-old. Uh, so I ask him uh, some of the things he does on a daily basis in order to uh, stay and act so young, which he, he provides his insight. Um, we talk about some of the myths around protein and dairy uh, that are out there and even dive into a bit some of the uh, new burgers out there, impossible burgers beyond meat burgers. And uh, lastly, we finish up with his uh, amazing a uh, platform called Moving Medicine Forward, where basically he educates uh, graduating doctors on a daily basis, weekly basis, the importance of uh, uh, nutrition to overall health. So sit back and enjoy today's show. Okay, it's my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Michael Clapper. Uh, Dr. Clapper, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Glad to be with you, Kevin, and your audience. It's a real privilege. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for our audience, uh, Dr. Clapper is a, a good friend and I'll say one of my very favorite heroes in the health space and even to narrow that down further, heroes in the plant-based world. Uh, we actually, to give you a little background, we actually met for the first time, I'll say pre-COVID. It was in uh, February 2020. I'm not sure if you remember that, uh, Dr. Clapper, because you uh, you traveled to so many different events, but it was on the uh, on a cruise ship, oh. uh, Holistic Holidays at Sea, which actually yeah. was my, my first plant-based cruise. My wife and I went, and I had no idea what this thing was going to be about. And uh, you know, you get on the sh you get on the ship, and it was a great great event. And literally, fifteen hundred to two thousand people are fellow plant-based people, and uh, and uh, we laughed because you know, as you know, all day there's speakers, pretty much all day, every day, and we're on this cruise ship. And many conferences I go to, you know, over the years, you go, oh, man, we got to go to a meeting. I did not miss a meeting. Like, literally, I couldn't wait to go to every single and get as much information. Uh, and as you recall, uh, you were the, one of the, the keynote speakers at the event and just did an amazing job. And every time we chat, I learned so much from you. So uh, thank you again from the bottom of my heart uh, for, for joining us today. I really, really appreciate it. You bet. Glad to help. Yeah. So, Dr. Clapper, if you wouldn't mind for our audience, um, 
could you just give some, I'll say some uh, background in terms of where you grew up, uh, how you grew up, uh, and then we'll kind of shift over into more of the plant-based discussion, but just to give some, some background and some, uh, some origins would be great. No, you bet. Uh, born in Chicago and uh, spent my first uh, 16 summers on my uncle's dairy farm in northern Wisconsin when I was growing up. I uh, went to medical school at the University of Illinois in Chicago uh, and uh, for the first 10 years of my medical career practiced regular blood and guts, uh, emergency medicine, urgent care medicine, operating rooms, emergency rooms, etc. Uh, and then in 1981 had my plant-based awakening and saw the amazing effects of a plant-based diet on my own body. Uh, and so I incorporated that into my medical care and I have been uh, a plant-based physician ever since for the past 35 going on 40 years. Uh, and I'm the happiest doctor I know. My patients get healthy right before my eyes. It's the most exciting type of medicine to practice. Uh, and I married to my lovely yoga teacher wife and uh, we are grateful for, uh, for every day on this planet in, with good health and good friends. So yeah, we glad to fill in details beyond that if you wish. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And, and I, I actually follow you in a number of ways, but on Instagram, I'm always amazed, you know, if there's somebody that truly, and I'll say a couple that loves life and enjoys every single moment, it's you. And uh, I love following you because you just your passion for life is, is contagious. So it's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, can you, uh, I, I mean, I know myself, I had a, I'll call it an awakening moment, uh, as you know, from, from reading my book. Um, did you have a, a, what was your awakening moment? You, mem you mentioned you've been plant-based for 40 years. So you were, you know, well ahead, I'll say of the movement that's happened, you know, exponentially in the last five years, but what was your kind of awakening or what, what, what was that moment? Well, uh, two undeniable, as much as I wished otherwise, two undeniable forces just encroached upon my awareness and back in 1981. Uh, on the left brain medical intellectual side, I was a resident in anesthesiology at Vancouver General Hospital in Vancouver, your lovely country. Yeah. Sure. And, um, and I was on the cardiovascular anesthesia service and day after day I'm putting people to sleep and watching surgeons open their chest and open the arteries of their heart, pulling this yellow greasy guck out of their arteries. And one day, I, uh, the surgeon pulled a particularly rubbery, slithery piece of atherosclerotic material out of the arteries that causes heart attacks and strokes. And I thought to myself, boy, that looks like chicken fat. I remember my mother cleaned chickens at the kitchen sink. I thought it was like chicken fat. And a little voice on my shoulder said, there's a good reason why it looks like chicken fat. It is chicken fat and cow fat and pig fat and the fat of these animals that this man was eating. And there were already studies in the medical journals uh, showing what, you know, this role of saturated fat and cholesterol in the establishment of, of this disease of atherosclerosis. Uh, plus, um, a plant-based diet can reverse and melt away these plaques. You know, that was, that was also in the literature in 1977. I read my first article about that. But my dad died of clogged arteries. I know I've got those genes. And, and I, I was realizing that if I didn't change my diet, and as soon as it was going to be me on that operating table with that striker saw going up my stern, and I sure didn't want that to happen. So I was getting the message uh, intellectually, my left brain, change your diet to a plant-based one. Uh, but then a, a few weeks later, um, I had a more emotional, uh, heartfelt awakening, not dissimilar uh, to the experience you and your son experienced uh, when you were fishing at your cabin uh, and you pulled in a bunch of fish and, and you killed the fish to eat them and you felt bad about taking their lives. And, and I had a similar uh, awakening. I was out uh, with dinner with another anesthesia resident and pontificating about leading a life of nonviolence. I had read about Mahatma Gandhi and Indian saints and I wanted to live a life of nonviolence. Here I was going to be an anesthesiologist swashing pain in people. And meanwhile, I was uh, expounding about this while polishing off a porterhouse steak at the local pig <laughs> in Cleaver. And my friend looked at me with great compassion and said, well, that's all very nice, Michael, but if you want to get rid of the violence in your life, you might want to start with that piece of meat on your plate because in satisfying your desire for the taste of flesh in your mouth, you are paying for the death of the animal and for the next one in line at the slaughterhouse. 
And as soon as he said that, all the old rationalizations jumped into my brain. Oh, well, that's what they raised them for. They're mammal dead already. But uh, before I could get the words out of my lips, that little voice on my shoulder said, you know, he's right. He's right. Yeah. And when I, when I went up to the cash register to pay for the meal, I felt complicit in a crime because because I grew, I spent all my summers on my uncle's farm. I saw the violence involved in putting meat on the table. I chopped the heads off chickens. I saw the old dairy cow shot in the head. There's no nonviolent way to produce meat or dairy. And, and at that point, I realized that I could no longer be complicit in, in sowing that kind of violence on these innocent creatures. So between what I was seeing in the operating room and what I knew in my heart that night in the restaurant, uh, that was the last meat I ate. Well, my body just loved it. Within 12 weeks, a, a 10 kilo spare tire of fat around my waist melted away. My high blood pressure went to normal. My cholesterol went to normal. I felt great waking up in a nice lean body every day. And at that point, I realized I didn't want to be an anesthesiologist and spend my time putting people to sleep. I'd rather go back to general practice and help them wake up. And so, uh, so I did. I left the anesthesia residency with six months left to go, much to my parents' dismay, and, um, and went back to general practice. And those patients who could follow the same plant-based diet and healthy lifestyle experienced the same wonderful ex ex effects. They got leaner, their blood pressure came down, their diabetes got better, I could get them off their medications. And to see this transformation is the most exciting, beautiful thing in medicine and in life in general, as far as I'm concerned. So uh, there's no turning back at this point. There's no going back. I use conventional medicine. If someone comes in with a pneumonia, I'll give them antibiotics. But then you got to say, why did they get that pneumonia? And how can we get them truly healthy? And it all comes back to a healthy plant-based diet and, and positive lifestyle practices. Well, and, and the work you're doing, I mean, it's, again, hats off to you, but it's so non-traditional. I mean, again, you know my story and from my book, I mean, I was, you know, not long ago, 12 years ago, I had high cholesterol, high blood pressure. I was pre-diabetic and I was about 50 pounds overweight. And, uh, and I remember my doctor that I share in my book, my doctor kind of said, well, Kev, it's normal. It's your, your middle age. Like, you know, this is, this is kind of, it made it sound like it was normal. And for me, it was a, a life sentence, right? It was like, I know if I go on these, I'm never coming off them. Right. So I, I'd actually challenge him on it. And, uh, you know, as you know, I said, you know, give me three months. And with to similar to your story, within one month, I was feeling better. I had more energy. I had lost about 15 pounds. Uh, so I asked him for my blood test and he said, uh, and he said, Kev, you, you've been abusing your body for, you know, 30 years. You're not going to change it like in a month. And I said, just for fun, can I have, uh, I'll do the blood test. Anyways, did them. And he phoned me back and said, you're my star patient. He goes, everything's not just average. It's, it's low. And it's, it's crazy how uh, it's crazy how the body really wants to heal. You know, the body wants to heal. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it yeah. Borders on magic. We, you know, every one of our tissues, the liver, skin, muscle, you, you, they get injured, they want to go back to normal function. How do they know to do that? But it, it puts me further in awe of this miracle that we walk around and uh, call the human body. And life itself, it, it's a healing force within us and on every yeah. level. Yeah, and your point earlier about uh, when you talked about the fish, you know, when, because I grew up fishing, right? I would fish with my dad, you know, and never really thought that we were killing fish. Like we'd go and we'd fish and it was part of the thing and we'd, you know, chop their heads off and clean them. Then we'd have a great fish dinner. And it wasn't until I kind of started down this plant-based and I started more from a health standpoint, but I, it wasn't until I kind of went down that path. And then I thought, I, we really, and even my son, he said, I, we, he goes, I don't really want to go fishing anymore. You know, like it was and, uh, like, even, uh, you know, I, I think we're the same that, you know, even if I find a spider in the house, you know, I, I take that spider and put it outside. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to kill the spider. <laughs> exactly. And we have, we have little plastic containers all over the house. And as soon as we see something, over goes the cup, under goes the card and out, out to the garden they go. Yeah. We don't wish you well. <laughs> yeah, we don't uh, tell too many people that, but uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so um, let me uh, ask you, and I'm, just to dive into each of these areas a bit, like from a plant-based, I mean, in, you know, your own personal story, 40 years, and you've been treating patients that long as well. Just share, if you can, you know, from a health standpoint, you know, what, what going plant-based, what are you seeing? Like, what are you seeing in your patients that, 
You know, you say, okay, what are you eating? Which again, most doctors don't even ask that question, but what do you, what's, what kind of results or what are you seeing when, when your patients go plant-based? Uh, well, I've been going around to the medical schools uh, trying to wake the young doctors up. They, we, you blow through four years of med school, cramming your head full of anatomy and physiology, but nobody sits you down and says, let's talk about what your patient's daily diet is doing to their body uh, as, as, to make sense about why they're sitting in front of you, overweight, hypertensive, diabetic, clogged up and inflamed. This is not a genetics doctor, it's what they're eating, but they're running through their bloodstream every four hours. I wish someone had told me that 50 years ago when I was a first year med student. And so as part of our Moving Medicine Forward uh, program, I'm going around to the medical schools now largely electronically uh, and, and trying to wake up the first, second, third year med students uh, to put this awareness into their head. And in doing so, I give a slide presentation. And in the slide presentation, we talk about what the classic animal-based meat, dairy, oil, sugar-based diet does to the bloodstream, how it uh, makes the blood thicker, makes it more acidic, makes it, uh, the, the cooking meat generates carcinogens uh, that sort of cancer, mutagens that damage your genes. There's endotoxin from the slaughterhouse um, bacteria there's a, a new 5GC. This is a sialic acid that only animals make, and it sets off inflammation throughout the body. Uh, I've got a whole list of the nine or 10 really toxic molecules that people consume with every meat meal. And then I say, as soon as you go plant-based, poof, all the onslaught stops, all this disappears. Plus you replace it with foods that are filled with water. It's a high water content diet. So it's like taking your cells to the car wash uh, and it cleans out a lot of the, the toxins that accumulate in the, in the tissues. But very importantly, the water makes the blood less viscous. It flows more easily. The nitric oxide generated in the artery walls dilates the blood vessels. So you increase blood flow to all the organs, the brain, the liver, the heart, the kidneys. You, um, when you change from animal fats, uh, which has uh, 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 rachidonic acid in it that sets off inflammation, to plant-based lipids, uh, they have omega-3s and omega-6 that, that calms down inflammation in the tissues. Um, it changes the microbes in your gut. Uh, when you eat meat, you spawn microbes um, that create that are part of the bacterioidetes uh, uh, group and they set off cancers, they're pro-inflammatory. When you go to a plant-based diet, the, the bacteroidetes subside and you culture the, the growth of these beneficial Prevotella bacteria. Uh, 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 skin oils change, so acne often goes away, psoriasis gets better. Uh, as these beneficial bacteria put positive neurotransmitters out into our bloodstream. People's moods often improve, depression often lifts. You can go down the list of uh, all these organ systems. The kidneys are under stress from a high protein diet. Uh, and people eat meat three times a day. Their kidneys are in the state of hyperfiltration and it damages them. This, when when your people are 60 and they have chronic kidney disease, where did that come from? from the eating animal flesh three times a day and driving those kidneys into hyperfiltration. So we could go through all these organ systems, um, but it's the, basically comes out, it's a, a meat-based diet, it's a long fuel for the human body. If, if you're a mountain lion, it's okay. But if you're, um, you know, we're basically plant-eating hominids. We, we've got fingers on our hands, not claws. We've got long intestines for digesting fiber. We've got enzymes in our saliva for digesting starches. Is that not a clue? We've got a small mouth with flat grinding molar teeth and a rotary jaw joint for eating roots and tubers and, and fruits. You know, we've got basically the same digestive system that our gorilla and bonobo cousins have, and they're up in the trees eating leaves and fruits. And when we eat a plant-based diet, you know, the body hums along like a fine-tuned vehicle. But you start eating flesh and oil and dairy, and it's like putting diesel fuel in a gasoline burning engine, and the spark plugs foul and the gas line clogs and black smoke comes out the back. Oh, my car has a disease. No, it doesn't. Yes, we're putting in the wrong fuel. Put wow. in the right fuel and oh, it runs great. So, um, so we see these changes that, that make sense after a while when you realize, you know, we're, we're not 
carnivores by nature, and a piece of raw meat is not something you want to put in your mouth. Raw apple sure is. So, um, so it's a matter of going back to the truth of our anatomy and our physiology and our nature and, and the gentleness that goes around that, but I guess that's not physiologic. And, uh, and so the body, it's not surprising. It's, it's wonderful to see these diseases disappear and transform, but it's, it's not surprising. It's what we expect when you put the right fuel in, in, the, in the engine there. Yeah, and what do you, and from a like medical condition standpoint, you know, what, what are some of the things that a plant-based diet is, let's say, curing or reversing? What oh, are some stunning. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, the most common diseases um, that people have, first of all, most Americans and people in the West uh, uh, die of artery disease. Their arteries are clogged up and inflamed and full of plaque. Well, when you change the plant-based diet full of antioxidants, those plaques that encroach into the blood flow channel, they start to melt away and, and the arteries begin to open up and deliver more blood. Blood flow is life. And as the arteries uh, get more normal in their function, they dilate, they relax, they have lowers high blood pressure. So you see hypertension disappear. The symptoms of clogged artery, the angina pain in your chest when you walk, the claudication pain in your legs, those, those go away. People are running, start, start running marathons as the arteries clean out. The um, so a high blood pressure, um, clogged arteries, diabetes, people think, oh, sugar, sugar, sugar. No, the high sugar is a symptom. That's the tail of the dog. That's really a disease of too much fat in the diet. The fat clogs up the insulin receptors. So when insulin knocks on the door of the muscle cell or the liver cell, nobody answers. So the sugar piles up out in the bloodstream and people, oh, don't eat sugar. It's the fat in the diet that caused the problem. So we see diabetes go away. It's so exciting to see not only these diseases like high blood pressure and diabetes go away, but there comes a point if they're on medication for high blood pressure, diabetes, their blood pressure starts falling so low, they, uh, they stand up and, and they get lightheaded from low blood pressure and pass out. Or their blood sugar, they're taking insulin, their blood sugar is so low that they get hypoglycemia. So at that point, you stop the medications. Things that I was told never happened. The first time I had a patient with diabetes, he said, God, my blood sugar is going down to uh, uh, you know, two with, with you Canadians, uh, down to the 40s and 50s uh, with the American uh, uh, units. Uh, I said those safe words, stop your insulin. You no longer need it, no longer diabetes. As soon as I said the words, I expected there'd be a puff of smoke and the ghost of my internal medicine professor would appear saying, what did you say? Stop his insulin. Nobody gets off insulin. But no, no, there was no puff of smoke. And I get, I've gotten lots and lots of people off insulin. Same with the high blood pressure. Stop your blood pressure pills. You don't need it anymore. It's dangerous. You stay on it. So you get to reverse these nasty diseases and to have a young woman with bad acne and have that clear up or a guy with bad psoriasis, you see that reverse. The asthmatic folks who reason all the time when you stop the dairy and half the folks, who I, in my, my opinion, half the folks, that's the end of their asthma when you get the dairy protein out. Um, the migraine headaches get much better or go away altogether. You know, pick a disease. If there's any nutritional component to them, you can expect some improvement and often uh, complete resolution. So it's just, yeah. you know, if there was a pill that did this, we'd be trillionaires, you know, but it's, it's the food, you know, I've got a, I've had this plaque in my office, you know, it's the food, it's the food, it's, 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 the food. Been, the, it's been the food all along, you know, and, and, and that's the truth of it. You know? yeah. It's remarkable, what a tool. Yeah, you know what? Well, I know uh, a good friend of both of ours is uh, Dr. Mike, Michael Greger. And I remember when I first read his book, you know, How Not to Die, which for our listeners, if you haven't read it, I'd encourage you to read it. Oh, there it is. Good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, there you go. It's right and on. While you're, and while you're reading good books, uh, definitely check this one out. It's just a jewel. And I'm going to start recommending it to my patients who need to transition to a healthy diet and lifestyle. I did not get paid for that commercial. Uh, thank you. Food. Thank you so no, much. Okay. But I remember when I first uh, read Dr. Greger's book, How Not to Die, you read chapter one. And each chapter for our listeners is on the leading cause of, of, uh, of death, actually. And, and you know, chapter one's on heart disease and chapter two is, you know, cardiac cancers and it goes on and on. But as, I, as you kind of get to chapter two or three, you realize 
it's all the same. It's just go plant-based. Like it's like, there's not, everybody thinks there's a diet for heart disease and a diet for diabetes and there's a diet for high blood pressure, but you know what? It's pretty much, it's your message. You know, it's the food and it's whole food plant-based, right? You got it, doctor. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So thank you. Uh, amazing from a health standpoint. So let me uh, switch gears and we touched on this a bit, but um, what are the benefits or what are you seeing? And we're kind of getting into bigger picture here from a plant-based uh, plant based diet. And um, I'll talk about the animals and cruelty to, animal, to animals that we're, we're finding in today's world. So maybe you can just, and you, you mentioned you, you, you grew up on a dairy farm, right? So, I mean, firsthand, you, you would have experienced that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, thank you for asking about this. Um, I, like most people, I love the animals. They're, they're magical creatures. And once you get to know them as individuals, um, they certainly are. On the farm, I, you know, I would sit down in the barnyard, the chickens would come over and, and jump onto our lap and, um, and, um, and talk and be, uh, uh, be social. They, they, all, they all love cuddles and they all love, um, uh, they all love love. And, you know, all animals respond to love. And the, um, <clears throat> the, uh, um, the cows themselves are magnificent creatures. And when I went in, to, every time we went in the dairy barn to milk them, there was this air of sadness about them uh, in the dairy barn. I didn't know why, but now I realized to keep that milk flowing, uh, you've got to keep taking calves away from their mothers. People think, oh, cows are in the dairy barn giving milk. That's what they do. No, they don't. They are giving milk because like all mammals, they just had a baby. Uh, and uh, for that reason, um, uh, you've got to keep making the cows pregnant. Uh, they carry their calf. And as soon as they have the calf, you've got to take that calf away uh, to, to harvest the milk or to take the milk to sell. And as a result, the, um, uh, the, I, I remember the, mo the most painful auditory memory I have is the, uh, is the sound of a mother cow locked up in the stanchion with her baby calf 10 yards away in the veal pen bawling. Uh, the calf is creamy and the cow is letting out these heart-rending, soul-tearing bellows hour after hour, day and night, day after day, three, four, five days. Because her calf, her baby is, is right there. She can't get to it. And, and that's inherent in cow's milk products, all of them. Every time a woman, uh, and I say women, because women are told you gotta eat your dairy for your calcium, for your bones. But the truth is every time you buy that piece of that container of Greek yogurt or Parmesan cheese, you're paying the, the dairy for, take another calf away from its mother. Yeah? And what happens to the, the male calves after four months, they're shot in the head, they have their throats cut and turn into milk fed veal. The dairy industry is a violent industry. There's no way around it, no matter what the images they portray. Certainly chicken flesh that you buy at the, at the you know, I, I chopped the head a lot of chicken. Man, these are lovely creatures who love their life as much as I do. Just, just a cruelty. And even, uh, even the, uh, the fish, uh, as you mentioned, I'm a scuba diver and we go, 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 go scuba diving and you're down there at 20 feet and this big old grouper comes along and, and looking at you. And there's somebody behind those eyes. There is a personality there. There is an entity there. And he's living his life. Well, you know, you're the stranger in his world. Um, all these creatures have an awareness. And, and what right do we have to, to deny them uh, their existence? Because we like the way their flesh tastes. Uh, especially when, when rice and beans and greens are, you know, just as nourishing. Now, there's just no justification for it. And we homo sapiens, we, we, we use killing as, a, as an everyday solution to problems. There's no, there's, no, there's no humility in that. There's no spirituality. This is time to make peace with the world, make peace with the animals, make peace with the natural systems. And, and a plant-based diet does that. You know, it declares peace with the animals. And in fact, we were out in the country a few weeks ago uh, and um, uh, I was with a friend and the, we went up to a fence where there were cows uh, and the cows came over to me, did not come over to my meat eating friend. And I suspect they could smell on our skin oils that, uh, that I don't eat, that I don't eat them. 
uh, but they didn't want anything to do with, with my friend who just had a hamburger. That's, and so the uh, world would like us to live in harmony and, uh, and uh, the bonobos give us a good, good lesson there on, on how to exist on, on plant-based diets and, and good relationships with other animals. You know, that's such a great message. Uh, I cycle a lot. We have a cottage up in Muskoka and I do a lot of cycling up there and, and I go by this, this uh, cattle farm and last year the cattle were there and then all of a sudden they're gone so we know what happened to them and so this year you know so now whenever i go by these cows i actually stop and i go over to the fence and they kind of wander over and like you they uh they they want to befriend you but i know those cows will be gone at the end of this season as well right and they'll be babies again which is which is terrible and i guess what i'd like to because I'll say myself growing up and all the years and I'll say till 10 years ago or 12 years ago when I went plant-based I um I never associated what I was eating I never associated what was on my on my plate right with with that's a, a cow I just killed or that was a fish I just killed like there was no really association it wasn't until I actually like I went plant-based for health reasons but it wasn't until I actually went plant-based that that I, I realized I kind of put those those together. You know what I mean? So I think most I think most people they don't even think about it. Like they just say, oh, that's a steak, or I always just oh, that's your meat, or that's your fish, or that's your chicken. But you don't actually associate that that chicken was alive like you know a week ago or two weeks ago or whatever it was. And you just don't put those together. And I don't know, I don't know what the like for me, I had to self-learn that almost, right? Once I went plant-based. But uh, any comments on that or or how we kind of get that correlation? <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, there's a, a hint of innocence. Your mother didn't know. My mother didn't know. You know, that's what their parents gave them. And you, you eat what your parents give you. And meat, you know, the government tells us is, is essential. You got to have meat, got to get your protein. And it's instilled, you know, little kids uh, by, you know, age two or three, they're eating, eating their happy meals. And it's just meat. Don't think about where it comes from. It's just meat, you protein, you eat it. And, uh, and so we grow up with this blindness here. We're not really asking where it comes from. And if someone tells us, we kind of laugh it off that the that, that door in the heart you know, kind of stays closed, and, which is why I never wag a finger at anyone who's still eating animal flesh, because I know what it's like to sleep that sleep. I, I was 35 before I had my awakenings of 34 years. Uh, I ate my burgers and hot dogs. And if you don't know, you don't know. But once you know, then you got an obligation to be true to yourself and to be true to the higher truth involved there. And so, uh, so that's why it's really important to be honest with their children about where meat really comes from. Because the kids know and when they find out that that leg of lamb was a lamb that one that they love, oh, a, a lot of kids are now going vegan because they just don't want to 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 hurt hurt the animals. And then there's a profound truth in that. Yeah. And now, yeah. Now we know. Yeah, I think we have two. Them. We have two plant-based vegan children, and our daughter. I mean, for different reasons, she went plant-based because of that. You know, she had watched that movie Babe. You know, with the, the yes, plant. right, yes. And, uh, and then the next day, we're actually driving to the YMCA, and there was a truck going by with all the uh, with all the pigs going to the slaughterhouse, actually, uh, or to the the meat factory. And she said, and she said, "Oh, there's Babe. There's Babe." And she goes, "Daddy, where are they going?" And I actually said you know that uh, bacon we had for breakfast this morning and my, and and literally she was seven years old and has not had meat since that day right? good for her good for you for being honest with her uh, yeah. that, that's such an important turning point in her life and you saved her from breast lumps and, and fibroids and painful periods and all that stuff you know it was a blessing beyond measure what what you two arrived at with that realization so good for you both yeah, thank you. So we've talked about the benefits of uh, and, and the reason to go plant based from a health standpoint, we've uh, talked about it, you know, in terms of I'll call animal uh, cruelty, and I love what you talked about, you put it in, let's make peace or harmony with the world. I love that. And one of the things that is very concerning right now, and a report just came out on the on on our climate and what we're doing to to the whole climate and we're actually they, they deemed it as we're now in code red you know we were in code green and code yellow and now we're in code red and so i just like your your thoughts on on this on plant-based um with the looking through the lens of 
uh, I'll say the world world health and and more importantly the world climate and just your, your thoughts on that. Well, thank you for that, and and uh, I urge you, uh, all your viewers here, please uh, get this wonderful little book called "Food Is Climate" by Glenn Mercer. You can download it onto your Kindle. Uh, you can read it in the evening. Uh, half of its recipes, uh, vegan recipe, but this is you know this is the whole book. But in this message, uh, he gives us this profound understanding that. We see what's happening to the world, no matter how much we, uh, the, the oil company, all those folks denied, uh, oh, the fossil fuel doesn't, you know, doesn't cause any problem. We not only have to stop burning fossil fuels, but, but Mercer makes it clear that with the carbon dioxide increasing, you can put solar panels on everybody's house. You can give everybody an electric car. What, it'll make only this much difference as far as taking all this carbon dioxide out of the air and really uh, reversing climate change. And even though they're trying to devise carbon capture technology, Mother Nature has already beat us to it. She's come up with the best carbon capture device ever designed. They're called trees. And when North America, before the white man came here, was covered with this magnificent forest, uh, which we promptly cleaved off to make cropland to grow corn and soybeans, to feed cattle, or to run cattle themselves. And, and as we've cut down half the trees, there were six trillion trees on planet Earth, we're now down to three trillion. And the problem is we, we don't let that land go back in the forest. So we keep generating more carbon, but the only thing that will matter is to let those forests return because as the trees grow, they take carbon dioxide out of the air and turn it into solid wood. And nature, we don't even have to plant the forest, she'll do it for us. But Mercer makes it very clear, the only thing that's gonna change our futures and keep an eco-catastrophe from happening uh, is to free up that land and let the forest return. And the only way to free up that land uh, is to stop eat, raising animals on them and let the forest come back. And so all you do is adopt a plant-based diet and let the forest return, you know, plants and cover, cover crops, these things that can be done uh, to speed up the process. But it's the key to our future. Nothing, if, unless we do that, nothing else is going to make any difference uh, in reversing climate change. So, well, what about the farmers and the ranchers going to throw them off the land? No, don't do that. They're, they're growing our food. But you don't have to run cattle on the land. Grow, grow hemp, grow broccoli, grow, 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 grow yeah. vegetables, grow anything on that land. Help the farmers and ranchers change what they're doing with the land. Pay them just money. Pay them to you know, send them to night school to learn how to grow new crops by their seeds form, by their equipment form, by crop insurance, pay the mortgage on their house for 10 years, send their kids to college, make it easy for them to make this transition and start growing plants. And we only need a quarter of the land because it's so much more efficient to feed vegetables directly to people than feed them to animals first. Um, that uh, we only, as I said, need a quarter of the land to, to abolish world hunger uh, there, and that would reduce the need for water and, and avoid the water wars that are impending. Uh, on every level, it would heal our society, would heal the planet, it would heal our relationship with the animals, and it would heal uh, our arteries as well. On every level, the, the lights are flashing. Homo sapiens, you, you want to be healthy as individuals, adopt a whole food plant-based diet. Homo sapiens is a species, you want to survive, adopt a whole food plant-based diet and let the forest come back. Yeah, it is, it's, it's, the, it's our life raft, it's our only hope uh, for simple. your kids and their kids. Yeah, it's pretty simple, isn't it? And, and as you say, really, we've done this to ourselves, I'm going to say over the last hundred years. Yeah, you think of, of man, I mean, it's really, it's literally been over the last since, I'll say since the Industrial Revolution. And a blink of an eye, as far as the earth goes, uh, they would cut down half the trees on the planet and burn them, essentially, put all those carbon dioxide in the air and stop them from taking the carbon dioxide back out. We've broken the cycles and, and like, we, like there's no tomorrow. Well, tomorrow is coming. The ice caps are melting. Good heavens. The seas are rising. Well, what, you know, get off. The train is coming. Get off the tracks. Uh, well, you know, what can you do? You can adopt a plant-based diet and help the forest come back. Help, That's the key. Help yourself, help the planet, help the world, and help our, our children and their children. 
Amen, brother. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amazing. Um, and, you know, along those lines, you, as you were speaking, I was thinking that a stat I heard, you know, in terms of uh, antibiotic resistance and, you know, 90% of antibiotics are actually given to animals, right, to, to their disease and, and everything else. And so a big, you know, big concern right now, if somebody gets an infection or let's say they get, you know, they have flesh eating disease or they have some infection, you know, there's certain antibiotics that work, but it's, it's becoming less and less and less because of antibiotic resistance, right? Absolutely. Um, back in the sixties or so, um, the, uh, uh, if somebody realized if you feed antibiotics, add it to cattle feed, um, it, it, they grow bigger and faster, so you make more money. That's all that matters. Uh, and uh, well, meanwhile, the, the, your, uh, you put the antibiotics down in the cow's guts and it kills off the, res the susceptible bacteria. What does it leave behind? The roughest, toughest antibiotic resistant bacteria going. So you wind up fostering these antibiotic resistant bacteria, the scariest thing in medicine. When we send off a culture of bacteria to the lab, they test it against various antibiotics and you get back a, um, a, a slip um, that uh, has all the different antibiotics listed with a little S for sensitive or a little R for resistance uh, if the bacteria is sensitive to it or resistant to it. It's the scariest thing in medicine to look at, a, at an antibiotic report and you just see R, 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 R all the way down because they're all resistant. Uh, and at that point, a strep throat becomes a death sentence, uh, a, a, an infected cut on your hand gets in your bloodstream and you die of septicemia. We were back in the bad old days. Yeah, for, for what? To, so, uh, so the beef rancher can make a couple more bucks uh, off, the, off the steer. Um, for, you know, the word homo sapiens, the word sapien, uh, there's an English word sapient, means wise. If you're sapient, you're wise, you know, the wise one. What a the misnomer of all the unwise things we are doing it's it's how we're supplying ourselves with food and, you know people say we've always eaten and no we haven't and we've all we've all we you know we used to do a lot of things we used to harpoon whales in the head you know we used to buy and sell black people we used to do all these things so what it's time to turn the page on that the era of meat eating is over while we eat fish we are clear cutting the ocean the time it's time to let the oceans heal. We've, we've used fishing up. We've used meat eating up. Whatever it was, and whatever the mighty hunter was, that era is over. It's time, if we want to survive in peace on this planet, it's time to adopt a plant-based diet, become truly wise, and start loving this life and the animals and each other. And all you need is love, like John Lennon said. And things will get better, but it starts with peace begins in the kitchen, they say. You know, what's on your plate? and no violence uh, on my dinner plate, thank you. And uh, at least as minimal as possible, I'm sure a few insects get crushed. You know? But you know, the, you, you do the best you can. You know, nobody's perfect. And no one's saying you have to be perfect. Like you said in your lovely book, you, know, you, you, you kind of eased into your transition, 80, 20, et cetera. And fair enough, we'll take that. If everybody got their meeting down to once a week or twice, we would change everything. Now, yeah. I'll take that for right now. Uh, you don't have to be 100% vegan, but it's, but see the true price of, of that piece of meat on your table. And, and uh, you know, people had to kill the animal themselves. Would you? Could you? You know, if, you, if the answer is no, I couldn't do that. Then, then how can we pay other people for doing that? We, you know, we have to take responsibility. That act of laying that money down on the table is so powerful. And whether you buy the, you know, the, the beef chili or the bean chili makes all the difference in the world, you know, and that's the only sacrifice you're being asked to make, order the bean chili instead of the beef chili, you know? Go, go with your wallet, right? Go with your wallet, we are, that's yeah. where the power is, absolutely. Awesome, um, so on that, uh, while we're on that subject, there are a lot of uh, uh, alternatives out there to meat that we're seeing in the marketplace. So I just, and you know, you go to, in Canada, we go to A&W and you can get a Beyond Meat Burger or Impossible Burger. and. You know, I love the fact that five years ago, even when I went to restaurants, I would actually get there early and talk to the staff about what I was, what I could order on the menu, because there are very few vegan options or plant-based options. 
Um, and, and I did that often because I didn't want to embarrass myself in front of a client or <laughs> whoever. But um, uh, now it seems everywhere I go, there are plant-based options on, on the menu, which is, you know, I love it. I love the fact that, that we're making that transition. Um, but, you know, some of them, uh, like the Impossible Burger, Beyond Meat, you, you know, they're all, they aren't meat. Uh, they're meat alternatives. Um, but what's your, what's your thoughts on, on those? Yes. I'm very grateful for those products. Um, for, they're very tasty. We haven't tasted one, folks. Uh, it's amazing. What the, these, and I was so happy that the, the, the food technology industry that's been giving us all this hyper palatable fat and sugar and salt uh, uh, for the chips and the schnips and all this stuff, they finally uh, use that brilliant technology to create a truly meat-like uh, plant-based uh, plant substance. And it's, it's delicious. It tastes like, you know, the best burger you ever had. You know, it's good uh, on your tongue. Now, let me be, as a physician and from a nutritional aware, let me absolutely recognize these are not the healthiest of all products here. They are processed. There's, you know, sometimes there's salt, there's fat. Yes, 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 uh, I agree. And no one's saying to eat this as your staple food every day by a long shot. These are treat foods. Um, you know, once a month, you know, have an impossible burger. But very importantly, if, if these are invaluable transition foods, if they help Joe Meat and Potatoes guy uh, change from real beef burgers to a really impossible burger, oh, I can eat that. That's not bad. Yay, you've saved his life and saved the animal's life and saved our own future. So as a transition food, I am very grateful for these uh, products. I think they have a, a real uh, a role to play. You know, they eventually kind of fade out of your life. You may have one or once or twice a week. And then after a few months, you have them yeah, once a week, then maybe once, once a month. They eventually kind of phase out of the diet as if the real whole plant foods take their rightful place huh? with these wonderful Asian curries and Mexican chilies and Italian pastas. You know, the real cuisine is, is really what you want to eat. But as a transition food, I'm very appreciative for them. But but don't linger there uh, as, as you, on your food journey there, but enjoy them as you pass through that phase in your dietary evolution. Yeah, or if you're stuck, you know, you're out of place and that's all they have. Like, you Absolutely. Know, you say, well, that's- Good uh, use for it, good use uh, for it. And so what, I, what you're really saying is there, it's plant-based, but it's not whole foods, right? Correct. And well it's said. whole food plant-based. Well right? said, well said. Now, now I heard a podcast recently and, and again, it was, I was very encouraged by it and it's, it's around cultivated meat, which is, you know, there's millions and I'll say billions of dollars now being invested, even from the, the major uh, meat uh, manufacturing and producing and companies in cultivated meat, which their real mission is to grow meat, uh, not meat, grow a plant-based, uh, uh, I'll call it meat, feel like, taste like uh, product, um, but it's 100% plants. So uh, what's, again, what's your thoughts on, on right. that? Um, I th I'm not sure if we're talking about the same thing, the cultured meat. Um, right. this, cultured, the, cultured meat. Cultured meat. This is animal muscle. I mean, they take a biopsy of a cow and, uh, and they start uh, replicating, they put it in a medium uh, that encourages that cell to divide, 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 divide. So they got a lot of muscle cells uh, and they shape it up into a burger or whatever, but uh, it's animal muscle. And, um, and that has interesting implications of it. Um, it's certainly better than killing the cow. And so for that alone, I'm very grateful for that. Um, it's, a, it's an expensive technology. It's, it requires a lot of high tech input, uh, a lot of amino acid baths, all that stuff. They're working to lower the cost there. And so, you know, I give them an E for effort there. Um, if, as the physician point of view, I'm a little concerned because it is meat. And what does it do to your cholesterol level? What does it do to your uh, kidney function? What does it do when, when you eat meat and you flood the liver with, um, uh, with all these amino acids from the meat, the liver responds by putting out a surge of this hormone called insulin-like growth factor 1, IGF-1. Uh, and this promotes growth throughout the body, which is great if you're a growing child, but if you're a, a, a guy with a prostate cancer or a woman with a breast lump, the last thing you want is a surge of IGF-1 fostering growth of tumors, et cetera. 
And that's my concern about these cultured meat. When, when, when you eat that, does it raise your IGF-1 levels? Um, and you've got to cook the burger, uh, even though it's from, uh, uh, from the... Uh, uh, from the from the vat from the culture vat. Well, when you cook it, are you creating carcinogens? Are you creating mutagenic aldehydes that damage genes? You know, it's still meat, and uh, so ecologically, it's certainly better. Ethically, it's much better. Nobody died, but health wise, I've got reservations about that. So yeah, that story has yet to unfold. Yeah, it's still uh, yeah, as you say, it's still meat, so it doesn't fit the equation of whole food, plant based. It's whole food. But it's not plant based. Exactly. Well oh. said, sir. You're yeah. good with it. <laughs> so, a couple uh, things that I know in the plant based world, you, you and I and others talk about all the time, and there are a couple myths that I, you know, I get asked this daily, and I'm sure you do as well. And you're probably sick of answering this question, but how do I get my protein? protein. How did I know <laughs> that that was going to be the question? Oh my. Um, and it's a real thing uh, because, again, since childhood, we're told meat equals protein. You must have your meat every day when you have protein. Uh, well, you know, ask any buffalo, ask any gorilla, ask any giraffe. You know, clearly, you can grow a massive mammalian body with thousands of pounds of rippling muscle uh, without ever eating cheeseburgers. So the protein must be in the plants. And of course, all protein ultimately comes from plants. Um, but to answer your question, where is the protein? All plant foods have protein. They all have amino acids, even fruits uh, and, uh, and lettuce. They all have some protein, but some of the uh, plant uh, members of the family uh, have lots of protein. We're talking about the legumes, especially beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils. They're 30, 40% protein, higher than meat, actually. Um, the whole grains, uh, certainly wheat, rye, barley, etc. But if you don't want to eat gluten, uh, uh, quinoa, millet, buckwheat, um, these are very rich in protein. Uh, and as long as, as um, these foods are showing up in your plate on a regular basis, uh, again, that bean chili, the, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, minestrone soup with the, with the fava beans in there. Uh, but anytime there's a whole grain, and certainly if there's a legume, all the soy products, everything from edamame to tempeh to tofu and all the things you can do with it. Um, it's, you, it, you can't eat 2,000 calories of, food, of whole plant foods, uh, which is what we should be nourishing ourselves out, um, without guaranteeing yourself at least 50, 60 grams of high-grade protein. It's in the rice and the beans and the nuts and the seeds and the, and the, and the whole vegetables and the whole fruits. Relax, there's plenty of protein. And as, as I've implied before, Americans eat too much protein and it promotes cancer growth from all the IGF-1 that's generated. Um, it, um, it, it damages the kidneys. High protein diets make the kidneys shift into a gear called hyperfiltration and, it, and, and holding the kidneys in that state month after month, year after year, damages kidneys and leads you to kidney failure. So uh, relax with the protein, eat your whole plant food, nurture yourself on whole plant food, the protein will take care of itself. It really is not a, uh, uh, not a great concern, but, but do you know, make your point that at least once a day you have some, something in it with, uh, with legumes. You know, I had some, we had some scrambled tofu a couple of days ago. Um, we'll throw some lentils into the soup tonight. You know, get some legumes in to do a meal at least once a day and you'll, you'll easily meet, meet your protein requirements. You looked after. Yeah, no, it was, uh, I was thinking of our, our call today because uh, yesterday I went for lunch uh, with a client and, you know, the person I was with ordered their, their meal. And then I, of course, ordered, uh, you know, my vegan soup and, uh, and salad. And uh, the waitress said, oh, would you like some protein with that? Of course. And I said, no, thank you. And I, of course, I don't get into it, but no, thank you. Indeed, okay. yes. Uh, it's a subtle euphemism. Yeah, uh, so we'd like a piece of dead animal in that. We'd be three, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you could, we, you know, we have beans or or there's a plant protein garden or so. Fine, you know, anything but but the animals at this point. Enough eating animals. And and we'll put this in the show notes. But for our uh, listeners, uh, a, a great book that actually one of the first books I read going down this journey was Colin Campbell's uh, uh, book China, China Study, and and it was amazing how they could you know, the, the research, they, they could turn on and turn off cancer simply with animal protein by adding and deleting animal protein, turn on the cancer gene, 
uh, turn off the cancer gene, right? It was Absolutely. Another sign, you know, that uh, we shouldn't be eating animals or the milk of cows, which is uh, what Dr. Campbell is using in those experiments. Yeah, there. exactly. So that's the other myth I wanted to ask you about. And, and I, you know, we know the answer, but I always hear, well, I need, you need dairy for calcium. I get that all the time. Like, oh, well, yes, you have to have dairy because we, that's where we get our calcium. Right. Yes, and again, bravo to the dairy industry that put the uh, imprinting in our head that cow, cow's milk is white, uh, chalk is white, calcium's white, therefore you need the white milk with the white calcium for your body. No, I mean, first of all, think about this. Cows don't drink milk, okay? <laughs> Where do they get all that calcium to put in their milk? It comes from the green plants they're eating. Calcium is in the soil and the green plants take it up. And, and that's what the cow's getting her calcium. Well, guess what? Uh, we can get our calcium from the exact same place, from uh, all these lovely dark greens, which you should eat every day. You should have something dark and green, kale, chard, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, bok choy. Um, there are lots of calcium there. Um, uh, nuts, seeds have calcium. There's plenty of calcium in plant foods. I've never had a... Uh, I had a gorilla come in with osteoporosis. They're, you know, they're, they're, they have plenty of uh, calcium in their diet. Uh, and um, too much calcium is not a good thing. It can lead to kidney stones, et cetera. But, the, but cow's milk is baby calf growth fluid. It's, it's full of growth factors that turn a 65 pound calf into a 700 pound cow as rapidly as possible. And again, if you're, and it's full of estrogens, the cows are all pregnant now. They genetically modified the cows. So they're pregnant, they're carrying their next calf and they're still sucking milk off these animals. So it's full of estrogens. And, and our little girls are going through puberty at age eight and nine and 10. Oh, why is this happening? Maybe it has something to do with that river of milk and cheese and ice cream and yogurt we're telling them to drink for their bones, for their calcium. But meanwhile, the girls are getting precocious puberty. They get more breast cancer. If a woman has a breast cancer and she's consuming cow's milk, it's like throwing gasoline on a fire. It grows more aggressively. The estrogen in milk make the prostate gland unstable. The more dairy a boy eats, the higher his risk of prostate cancer when he's a man. Again, the lights are flashing. You have no more need for the milk of a cow than you need the milk of a giraffe or a horse. Would you, would you pour rat milk on your cereal? How about some dog milk to drink here? Well, good heavens. But, but somehow we think that cow milk is, is good for us. It's not. You're an adult human being. You have no reason to be, even a child, you have no reason to be drinking the milk of a cow or eating anything made from it. And nowadays, the, the lovely vegan cheeses is the product. They're not whole foods. But some of these vegan cheeses made from cashews and almonds, et cetera, they're brilliant in there. And they're a treat food. They're a little smear on your cracker, you know, once a so week. But, uh, but there's just no reason. And all these lovely plant milks now, you can, what am I pouring on my cereal? I'll try oat milk, hemp milk, rice milk, almond milk. You know, there, there's just no reason to be consuming the milk of a cow and a whole lot of reasons not to. So move the, the dairy off your plate there and you'll be a lot healthier for it. Yeah, for sure. No, and as you say, there's so many great alternatives and they taste amazing, right? They actually they do. Taste they great. do. I know you and I, we look at the ingredients, but any of those alternatives, and even if you, you know, we've made our own almond milk, it's amazing. Yep. My wife makes it in the morning. She soaks the almonds overnight. And yeah. I know it's time to get up. I hear the blender going. <laughs> and and, uh, and no, there's just no reason. It's time to shut that whole atrocity down. That sad dairy uh, operation. Uh, it's time to put that in the dustbin of history as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dr. Clapper, I'd just like to, you know, in my book, I talk about the wheels of health and you are a picture of health. Uh, actually, when you were on the keynote last year, uh, and I believe you were, and, and so if I'm going to ask your age, but I think you're 74 now, is that what you I'm are? 74, absolutely. So I went, well, went for a 40 mile bike ride yesterday. I feel great. Take no medications. I feel like I did when I was 40. I don't feel much different. So yeah, yeah let's hear it for 74. Exactly. Amazing. And uh, um, so that's what I wanted to ask you about, because actually when you were on the keynote, my, my wife Googled you and she, she thought you were actually early 50s. And, I, and, she, and when, I, when I, I, she looked at the age, she said, there's no way you were 73 at the time. I'm like, she said, there's no way. And I go, yeah, he is. Play yeah. Base, right? Play and, uh, yeah. So a couple of things, you know, one of the things I talk about in the wheels of health is one of them is, is mindfulness and mindset. 
And, you know, looking at you, you know, your mindset's amazing, but you know, how, what do you do from a mindset standpoint to like, you actually act like you're a kid. So what do you, you know, what are you doing to, to keep that amazing mindset? Oh my, well, similar to the spokes of your wheel there, I, I, I've made it a point to start getting enough sleep. It's so important. You, you can't cheat on your body. You think you are, it's three in the morning, you know, you know, I'll be okay. No, I'm not. And I pay for it for the next two days there. So be, be, be square with your sleep needs and, and definitely do that. Um, and one advantage of being 74 is that my threshold for things to get upset about has really risen greatly. And the older I get, the fewer things uh, bother me. And what if, I, if I'm late for a dental appointment, I don't have my cell phone and I can't you know, call them. And I, you know, I'm thinking, Michael, a year from now, six months, are you even gonna remember that you were late for a dental appointment? You were not gonna remember. So, so let it go I and mean, put it in the river of life, let it go downstream. You know, it, it's small stuff. And, and what I now see is small stuff. It's most 98% of, of what we're faced with. You know, big stuff, you know, people live, die, get born, fair enough. But, um, but I've become much more forgiving and, and, and much more the serene. My serenity is important. And the things that people get upset about politics, it's just not worth it. The important things is how much love do you have in your life? Uh, you know, what can you do to help somebody? How, you know, the most important word for were, how can I help? What can I do? Yeah, you know, if, as long as you're focused on putting your love out in the world and, and, and soothing, soothing distress and disharmony in every way that you can, starting with your own example, including what you eat, what you order at the restaurant, you know, as long as you can put love and healing vibrations out there, then, then it comes back to you as well. We're here for such a short time now on this life, on this planet. When I get to my last day on earth, I want to look back and say, yes, you know, life will live. Thank you. Now I, I put a lot of love into this world. God's got some back. I'm a, I'm a happy man. And so, um, so it's a matter of perspective. When I was 16, I didn't have this perspective, but one advantage of got to get to 74 is uh, a lot of things. It's okay. You know, we'll, we'll deal with it later, you know? So uh, it's all about love. That's with a capital L and just find a way to love every day and everything else will work itself out. Love yourself, love lay neighbor, love the planet. Yeah, no, well, very, very well put. I, that, I love that. <laughs> so, thank you, brother. Right. And you mentioned uh, you yesterday you went for a 40 kilometer bike ride. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know right. I see your Instagram, you stay very active. So, do you have like a regimen when it comes to, I'll say, movement? Yes, I sure do. It's really important. Please, folks, here, keep, first of all, keep your flexibility. By good fortune, I married a yoga teacher, but man, keep your spine flexible, do those salutations to the sun, do, you know, if the, nothing marks an old man or old woman, if they got a stiff spine and they move all bent over as a unit. So keep your flexibility, keep doing the, those uh, flex, flex, the flexibility exercises or, and or yoga. Uh, and I have a, um, I have a recumbent in my living room. I've got a recumbent stationary bike with the kind you sit up on, not hunch over. And um, so every other morning when I'm not doing my yoga, I get on a recumbent bike, turn up the, uh, uh, the uh, resistance, start pedaling. And while I'm pedaling for cardio, I grab two 10 pound hand weights. Uh, and for the next 40 minutes, I'm doing upper body work. I'll cross my arm, hold it behind me uh, and uh, hold it out as long as I can isometrically. And man, 40 minutes of pedaling and doing upper body work, and you work up a good sweat and it pays my aerobic dues. So when my friends say, hey, we're going for a bike ride Saturday, you want to come? I can, yep, I can do 40K. And uh, so, yeah, and the nice thing about the recumbent bike is that I don't have to deal with trucks on the road and whether it's raining or blood, it doesn't matter, you know, and it takes away my excuses. So whatever you do, you got a treadmill, you got, you got, you got a date to play basketball, just stay active and well into your 70s and 80s. It pays such big dividends. So yeah. uh, hold on to your physicality. It's very yeah, important. I, that's so awesome. And you're, you know, you're combining your your strength training and your and your cardio and your flexibility. So you're hitting all the areas, you know, which, which is awesome. So, and, uh, you know, I, I know after the plant-based cruise, we ended up in a hotel uh, in Miami and you were in the same hotel. And I remember I was, I was coming in the gym and you were leaving. So it's, uh, I know you oh, walked. That was you. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> 
So uh, yes, uh, fair enough. So I know uh, just to just before we finish, because um, I do want to touch on uh, moving medicine forward just before we finish. But you know, if you were the Surgeon General for USA or the Surgeon General for Canada or let's say the world or North America, um, or you had them, they were interviewing you, you right now. What would your advice be to them right now? Oh my, such such an important question. Um, I'll, I'll answer that question, but if one of the greatest disappointments, sources of pain and uh, uh, throughout this COVID crisis that we've been in is all the missed opportunities. Back a year ago, March, at least in America here, uh, if the, the head doctor, if Anthony Fauci, any of those folks had gotten on TV, looked at the camera and said, listen, you folks are going to be in your houses for two months or so, eight, 10, 12 weeks. Use this time to get yourself healthier. Start eating more plants. Start doing some exercises. Start getting yourself leaner and healthier because this virus kills obese, sick people. Uh, that would have made such a difference. And even now, and, you know, they're still playing uh, uh, hear no evil and see no evil. And speaking of evil, unfortunately, it wouldn't be evil, it'd be healing. Um, so, if so, what the Surgeon General should have said, indeed, um, shift your diet way towards plants. Don't use the V word or too much bag. Eat more plants, have a plant based meal twice a day, get your meat eating down to once a day. Start with that because uh, that would cut down our meat eating by two thirds. That would have to have beneficial effects. So I would certainly, I would just start with that one to, to begin with and give them all the reasons why lower your cholesterol and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it turns out that it looks like the, the next mayor of New York City, I'm going to be Eric Adams, who's a vegan. Yeah, and, I saw that. Uh, really, I have a vegan mayor of New York City. Let's see uh, what, what comes of that. But, but, and Cory Booker, U.S. Senator, is a vegan. Um, we'll, uh, we'll see as more and more people with, with plant-based awareness gets into uh, positions of power, hopefully uh, they'll start having an effect, but it would definitely change your diet to a more plant-based diet. I, I'd be happy if people just did that. Yeah, no, it's a great, great message and a great uh, start. And uh, you should be the uh, Surgeon General with that <laughs> comment. <laughs> Um, let's just finish off if it's okay. I know we talked about your moving medicine forward and, you know, uh, the, what I really like about it, instead of you, uh, you know, looking after one patient at a time, you're actually changing the future and you're doing that by educating and spending time with uh, graduating and young physicians and the, and the medical community. Um, so can you just comment on that? And, and also second part of that would be, is that gaining traction from, from your per perspective? Uh, indeed, thank you. Um, as you mentioned, we, uh, uh, I was so concerned that the abysmal ignorance of my profession, it's embarrassing the way doctors don't ask about what their patients are eating because that's why they're sitting in front of you, doctor, overweight, hypertensive, diabetic, and inflamed from what they're eating. Uh, and, and as I, stand, as I stride up to the microphone uh, at the medical schools, uh, I say, listen, I'm going to give you the lecture I wish somebody had given me 50 years ago. It would have changed every diagnosis I made, every treatment plan. Um, it's the food. <laughs> Start before you order another $1,000 scan, another $500 set of lab tests. Stop. Ask the patient what they ate yesterday. And if it's full of burgers and buffalo wings and pepperoni peaches, that's why they're sitting in front of you, doctor, uh, with all these medical problems. Send them to the plant-based dietitian. Let her show them the videos, go over the articles with them, take them shopping, whatever. You just see them back in a month. See if they're not leaner and healthier, which they will be. Um, so pull the dietitian onto your team. Find the plant-based ones. There's getting to be more and more of them. Uh, and and start, uh, start starting with the patient's diet as, as, the, as square one as far as their treatment plan goes. Well... <clears throat> It's getting much easier to get that message across. I've been to 35 medical schools in North America. I've been to New Zealand, Australia, Poland, Lithuania. Uh, and the message uh, is very well received. Nobody sits, a couple of professors always sit in the back room and go tut tut. But the medical students, 
are very receptive because nowadays in every medical school class, there's 20, 30 students. They've seen movies like Forks Over Knives. They've seen What the Hell. They've seen Cowspiracy. They've read the China study. The light is on. They just need an experienced physician to tell them, you're not crazy. This is where true healing begins. And so I've had a very positive response from the medical student. I get lovely uh, letters back from, from residents and from practicing physicians, or, I was going to say across the country, but around the world. I was up in, uh, uh, I've been doing since COVID. I've been doing this mostly by Zoom. But thanks to them, I've uh, I lectured at the University of Calgary in, in Alberta. Uh, I've, um, I was at uh, uh, one right outside of Toronto. I'm blanking on the name. Were you, you were at University of Buffalo, I believe. I was at University of Buffalo yeah. two yeah. weeks ago, absolutely. And so we're doing this more and more by Zoom, one of the left-handed blessings of COVID. It, actually, I'm, I'm able to reach an ever wider audience. Uh, if people are interested, um, I'm sure you'll have it down there. Go to uh, my website, drclapper.com, all spelled out, uh, and click on Moving Medicine Forward, and you'll see what we're doing and how you could help us. And I have a YouTube channel of Dr. Clapper. I, I post videos three times a week there on topics of interest. Uh, and so I invite people to open to the plant-based message. And, to, and if you would like it, well, how beautiful it'd be to go to your doctor's office. And one of the first questions, yeah, tell me what you're eating. I really want to know about, uh, about your nutrition. Well, hallelujah, you know, the heavens would open up if, if all doctors asked that question. And that's what we're shooting for. So uh, you can help, but uh, thank you for asking about that. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And, and just to follow that up, and not only that, if the prescription they wrote on the prescription uh, pad instead of statins or other it would be a uh, plant-based diet, right? Yeah, absolutely. I have a prescription pad made up with the, that very thing. I don't know, the, the Plantrition Project has pre-printed uh, prescription pads. Go to the Plantrition Project and you can order them yourselves, any doctors out there. So Thanks for mentioning that. That's awesome. And I follow that. So um, again, we will put that in the show notes for sure. And I just like to, in appreciation of, of you being on our podcast today, Dr. Clapper, uh, on behalf of our co my company, Advoca Health, what we're about is helping people be healthier every single day. Uh, we're mainly focused in Canada and we're trying to get that message out, but we'd like to make a thousand dollar contribution to moving medicine forward. Oh, you know, how lovely. Being on our uh, show today. Thank you so much. What a beautiful gesture. And it will help me and help us reach even more medical students and, and uh, open up more young doctors' minds and hearts through plant-based message. So thank you very much. Ray. You're doing amazing work. And so just to finish off again, as I said, when we started out, you know, you are one of my hero heroes. You're a game changer in the whole plant-based uh, movement. And I'll say just, not just, just plant-based health movement, um, and it came through loud and clear. I mean, you, you're, you're looking after your patients, you're looking after your community, and you're looking after the world to make the world a better place. And it's, uh, and it's so nice. And, and, you know, what comes across is you truly care and you truly love, you know, the planet and, and the world. And you're, you know, I, no wonder you have a great sleep every night because every night you can put your head on the pillow and go, you know what, I made the, I made the world a better place today. Yeah, which is awesome. Oh, well, thank you so much, Kevin. If people would like to do a consultation with me, go to plantbasedtelehealth.com. And I, we deal with a lot of Canadian folks. I'll be glad to, to act as your personal physician. So it's plantbasedtelehealth.com. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for this remarkable interview. You're an excellent interviewer, by the way. Thank you. Uh, God bless. And we'll see you, uh, see you at the next plant-based event. Fair enough. Thank awesome. you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for tuning into our podcast today. For all of our listeners, I invite you to visit AdvocateHealth.com where you can easily become an Advocate member to take advantage of some of the amazing services we offer. You can also access our latest blogs and listen to some of the best medical advice available on our podcast. Don't forget to grab a copy of my latest book, It's Never Too Late to Be Healthy, that is available to order through our website. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.